Hello everyone. Uh, please confirm once in the chat box if I am clearly audible to all of you. Uh, please confirm in the chat box. If I'm audible. <clears throat> so that we can start off uh, the session. Okay, fine. Uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to today's session in which we are going to solve the CPWD question paper of 2015. 2015 in the sense the examination was held in 2016 but since the notification was released in 2015 so that's why uh, your CPWD paper 2015. Now uh, those of you who are aware who are aware of the recent form fillings you know that recently CPWD has released a vacancy for the post of your deputy architect. Okay. Now, uh, for this, the examination date has not yet been given. Uh, it will be released soon because the form filling date has yet not finished. The last date of filling of the form is 27th of this month. So, make sure that if you have not filled up the form, you please fill up the form. Okay. Apart from that, last year, that is in 2022, CPWD has had released 13 vacancies for the post of assistant architect, for which the examination will be held on 19th of August, that is next month 19th, okay. So, if you are somebody who is preparing for that examination, then definitely uh, having an idea of what was asked in your previous year question, it will definitely be very useful to you, okay. So, in today's session, we are basically solving your CPWD previous year question paper of 2019 for the post of assistant architect. Okay. So, one by one, again, the same format which we have followed in the previous classes, uh, it will, there are 120 questions. Uh, it will take four sessions to go through everything in a very detailed manner. So, be in touch in the four sessions. We'll have a session today, tomorrow and on Sunday. And then you'll be given the update about the next session as well. Okay. We will go into it in detail. That means we will definitely look into the question and the answer. But we will also try to understand about the other options which are present. Okay. Fine. So, without any further ado, let's start with the first question of your CPWD. Now, uh, for those of you who are wondering what is the syllabus and everything. See, syllabus and everything is given in the, uh, the notification which has been released. So, if you go to the UPSC website, you will see that they have released a notification for your assistant architect post in which they have said that the examination will be held on 19th of uh, August between 2 uh, p.m. to 4 p.m. They have given all of those things. In that notification only, they have given a list of, uh, you can say topics or list of headers which is under your syllabus. Very uh, broad listing is being given. It's not in detail. It's written this housing is written, planning is written. So, it's not given in detail, okay, but overall you can understand that you have to basically study, you have to have a little bit more focus on the architecture part and then, but you should also be aware of the planning aspect, okay. And based on the analysis of previous year question paper, that is this one, we can understand that which are the areas from which questions can be asked in this part, particular part, okay. Fine, let's start with the question number one, that is a screen usually of lures placed on the outside of a building to shield the window from direct sunlight is drum ball, solarium, brace solar, chrome ball. Okay. <clears throat> they are saying that a lower kind of a structure. Lower, you know, let's say if this is a building, if this is a building facade, then this kind of a structure you have. Some kind of shading, it, it, it's not mandatory that it's going to be horizontal. It can be any kind of vertical shading also. Also, basically some kind of lures you have, which is placed on the outside of the building to protect in order to prevent direct sun rays entering into that building, what is that called? So, this lower type of a structure it is known as your brace solar. So, the answer will be C. Now, question is that what is drum ball, solarium, and drum ball? Okay. Drum ball is basically what? See, drum, drum ball and drum ball, these are basically, you know, heat thermal storage uh, concept. These are based on your concept of thermal heat, thermal storage. Now, what is drum ball? Drum ball is basically what? Let me just draw the image for you so that you can understand. As the name suggests, drum ball means you are using 
drums. Drums are what? You, you have huge containers in which you store water. So you're using huge drums which are painted black and have water in them. And these drums or these water, uh, you can say water structure, they are used to store heat. How? Let's look at the image. Let's say this is a house, okay? You have a, this is basically a glass kind of a paneling, okay? This is the glass paneling. This is the glass paneling. Beyond this, you have a structure. This kind of a structure is there. Basically, you have multiple stacks of drums. These are what? These are multiple stacks. That means drums which are placed one on another. These drums are filled. These are what? These are drums. You fill this drum up with water and then you paint this entire drum black in color. So what happens when you have sun, when basically sun's rays heat hit this drum, what happens is it gets trapped by the drum. So the heat is basically stored by the drum, by the water. It heats up the water and slowly, slowly the heat gets stored here. And this heat is basically dissipated to the inner part of the room slowly, slowly over the period of time. So this, basically these uh, drums which are painted black, these act as a storage, thermal storage, okay? And if required, let's say at night, simultaneously it will allow, it will basically prevent the heat from, you know, basically leaving. So what happens at night, if you want to store the heat in this drum, this will basically act as a storage for the entire day. So at night, even when you don't have the sun, it will, it will be storing in heat and it will heat up the entire area. And at night, if you want, you can basically have a shutter kind of a thing. So there can be a shutter kind of a thing which is attached by some kind of a pulley. Here, some kind of a pulley system can be done. And you can basically, you know, close this um, shutter so that you can shut down the entire, you can, you know, cover the entire glass wall and you can prevent any kind of heat from dissipating outside. This is what your drum wall is. Next question is, what is trome wall? Trome wall is similarly, instead of drums, what you have? You have a structural wall. Here, in place of drums, you have structural wall. And there is a cavity, so something like this. This is the glass wall and this is the glass wall and behind the glass wall you have the structural wall and you have two vents. Two vents, one on the top and one on the bottom. So what happens, the heat is basically being regulated by the concept of convection. Convection, you know what is convection? When the heat, when the air gets heated, it rises above, it basically rises and the cold air, it can basically come from beneath. So what happens over the period of time when the sun, it heats up this cavity. This is the cavity, this place <clears throat> between the wall and the glass, this is the cavity. Over a period of time when it is being exposed to the sun rays, it gets heated up. When it gets heated up, what happens is that the air rises above and it basically enters. So this is the living area. This is the living room here. The air basically enters the living room through the vents on the top. And the cold air which is there in the living room, it basically exits the living room through the vent which is present in the bottom, towards the bottom of the floor. This is what your trom wall is, okay? Again, this is also a way through which you can basically regulate the heat over a period of time, fine? This is what your trom wall is. What is solarium? Solarium is basically, initially it was used with respect to your Greek houses. So in Greek houses, uh, you had a roof, on, you had a room on the top of the terrace, which was, you know, completely lit by sun. Solarium is what? Solarium is like a glass, it is a glass house, kind of a thing. In which what happens, you have, it, which is completely lit by sunlight. So, solarium is like a kind of a room, whose main, you can say primary motive is to have the maximum amount of light through the sun rays. Take it, that is what your solarium is. So, now you know what are the different options also, fine? Okay, I hope this is clear to you. Next, we go to question number two. A vertical diaphragm acting as a thin, deep cantilever beam in transferring lateral loads to the foundation is pneumatic structure, shell, membrane, shear board. <clears throat> okay. 
What are they saying? They are saying that there is a vertical diaphragm which is acting as a thin deep cantilever beam in transferring lateral load to the foundation. So any kind of lateral load is transferred to the foundation through this beam. Which is that beam? That is your shear wall. Always remember, shear wall is what basically? Shear wall is always provided to It is always provided to resist shear forces or you can say lateral forces. Any kind of lateral forces? Lateral forces are what? Let's say if this is a building, something that is acting laterally. We know that there is something called dead load, light load which is acting towards the ground but there are forces which is acting laterally to the building. What is that? You can have wind load, right? You can have, let's say in case of earthquakes, you have the building basically moves from, moves in this direction. Left, right, left, right, right. So in that cases, you need to have a structure which can transfer that shear force. So shear wall is a uh, basically wall or you can say it's kind of a uh, beam-like structure or you can say it's, it's, a, it's a vertical membrane. Don't get confused with the name beam. It's a vertical membrane which transfers all the shear force or you can say all the shear load from the building to the foundation. So it is there, shear wall is there to resist the lateral load. Lateral load means your wind load. Or your earthquake also. Take it. So now coming to the next options. What is a pneumatic structure? Pneumatic structure is basically it is made up of a membrane. So sometimes you must have seen in certain tent like structures what they do. They blow in air into membrane. You have thin thin membrane something like this. It's a membrane which is in tension and this membrane is basically supported by air. So there are thin membrane kind of structures, let's say some kind of a tensile, some kind of a clothing structure and you fill in air. So because of this tension of air, the structure is stable. That is known as your pneumatic structure. Shell is what? Shell is basically nowadays you must have seen, shell is your thin, you must have seen there are buildings like this and there is roof structure like this. So these are thin structures which you know the entire motif of shell is what it can cover huge distances or you can it can cover a large span of area without being supported by b or without being supported by any kind of column so that is the use of shell nowadays a lot of places shells are used and membrane is what membrane basically you have tent like structures so something like this let's say you have a structure and then you want to you know put up a support and then you want to put up the membrane or you, have, you want to put up the clothing material on that to create a tent like structure to basically cover an area that is known as membrane okay so these are the different options which is means so whenever you talk about transferring any lateral load to the foundation it is your shear wall it is not pneumatic structure it is not shell it is not membrane look into an image of pneumatic structure you'll understand what pneumatic structure is okay fine next question question number three a glass unit consisting of two or more sheets of glass separated by a hermetically sealed airspace to provide thermal insulation and restrict condensation is reflective glass, heat absorbing glass, low emissivity that is low E glass or insulating glass. The answer is insulating glass. Basically, whenever you have something like this, you have one glass panel and then you have some cavity and then again you have another glass panel again you have some cavity and, and then again glass panel so this is what this is your cavity or you can say this is the air in which you have or this is the portion in which air is trapped and this is the glass this is the glass part so you have three four layers of glass and between the glass you have the air trap hermetically sealed air space okay this is actually an insulating glass. This does not allow, it basically acts as an insulator between the heat transfer. So it does not allow the heat to readily enter. Obviously over a period of time it will enter. But it reduces the rate of heat entering into the building. Okay. So this is your insulating glass. What is a reflective glass? Reflective glass is nothing but you have a glass. And on that glass you have a coating. You have a thin coating which reflects of the light. Reflects of any kind of radiation. That is your reflective glass. Okay. 
Heat absorbing glass is a glass which can readily absorb heat. So definitely you don't have any insulating property. So whenever insulation comes, obviously it won't be heat absorbing glass, right? And then you have low emissivity or low E glass. What is low emissivity? Emissivity means C. Every object gives out some kind of a radiation. Let's say if you're talking about a building, if you're talking about a window, it will have some kind of a radiation. It will radiate out some energy, right? Because over a period of time, it was absorbing certain energy. And when it absorbs, it will also radiate out. So even glass windows, they radiate out certain long wave UV radiations. Okay? Now we want low emissivity. Why? We don't want these UV radiations, these long wave, uh, this long wavelength UV radiations to enter into the building. So we don't want it. What do we want is basically we want the light to enter, but we don't want any kind of long wavelength UV radiations to enter. So in that case, we use low emissivity or low E glasses. Basically, you can remember high reflective. Whenever you have high reflectivity, your emissivity will reduce. So with just write it here. So if your reflectivity, if any glass has a high reflectivity, it will have a low emissivity. Okay. Emissivity means, see, once it absorbs energy, it will radiate, right? If it is not absorbing, that means if it is reflecting off energy, obviously it is not going to radiate anything inside. It will not allow anything to enter into. It is reflecting off. So higher the reflectivity, lower will be the emissivity, right? This is what your glass is. So definitely when we talk about two, three layers of glass with some kind of a space, or you can say sealed air space between them, that is your insulating glass, okay? Let me know if you have any problem anywhere. Okay, next question. Sky component is an element of earthquake design, daylight factor, rainwater harvesting, thermal performance analysis. Sky component is a factor of your, is a component of your daylight factor. What is daylight factor? Daylight factor is what? It is the amount of illumination inside a room compared to the illumination that is outside a room. Let's say we are standing in, inside a building right so we are basically trying to compare what is the level of illumination or how well lit is the inside of a building as compared to the outside let's say in the morning obviously outside is very well lit but how lit or how illuminated is the inside of the building that ratio of the illuminance inside the building to the illumination outside the building is known as your daylight factor so daylight factor basically has three components what are the three components one is your sky factor sky component that means basically they are saying that the amount of illumination how well lit your room is it will depend on three factors first sky component that means the light which is coming from the sky obviously the more light you have from the sky the more lit your room will be second is externally reflected component that means sometimes you must have seen let's say i have a window maybe the sun is not directly coming into my room but there is a building which is beside my room the sun is hitting the building and the rays are getting reflected off and then entering into my room so what is happening that light is coming in my room because of an externally reflected component you must have seen especially in hot uh, you know seasons when it is extremely sunny and in, you know, uh, let's say urban areas, there is a lot of heat which is coming, a lot of light which is being reflected off different buildings. So that is not the direct light which is coming from this uh, sky. It is the reflected light which is coming in. So that is because of the externally reflected component. So maybe your room is well lit because there are buildings beside your house and the light is bouncing off or the light is getting reflected from the inside of the, from that, those buildings and coming inside your room. That can also be anything that is your externally reflected component. And third is internally reflected component. Internally reflected component is sometimes what happens, let's say I'm sitting, I'm sitting on my table, fine. Let's say the sunlight is not directly coming on my table, but it is hitting a surface which is inside my room. Let's say there is some kind of a mirror inside my room or let's say there is some kind of a, uh, you know, a reflective surface inside my room. And after hitting that surface, then it is basically getting 
it is bouncing off to my table it is bouncing off from there and then it is basically lighting off my table that can also happen sometimes what happen inside your room some kind of a reflection takes place because of which you are working plane okay we are basically trying to measure the illumination level on the working plane because of which your working plane will be lit let so that is why internally reflected components are also taken into consideration so these three are the components which determine the level of illumination inside a room specifically on a working plane that means if you are sitting on a table specifically on the table what is the level of illumination right okay? so definitely sky component is a factor of your it's it's a comp, it's an element of your daylight part next question number 5 architectural design today need not address climate considerations energy efficiency style style stylistic affiliations user response architectural design today need not address okay so basically this is something that is based on your understanding that you will not uh, study this anything anywhere you have to use your own common sense to answer it they are asking you that architecture design that we do today it does not take into consideration which of these following obviously you have to take into consideration climate considerations why because climate is a very important factor especially today in our days situation so that is taken into consideration energy efficiency is also taken into consideration user response that means what is the response of the user of the building is also taken into consideration stylistic affiliation can be left out out of these four option this is something that we generally do not base our entire design on definitely you do take into consideration style also but you don't completely uh, base your entire opinion on that okay next question number 6 designing responsive architectural spaces requires consideration given to passive cooling system innovation in structural system smart building system user satisfaction that means whenever you're designing any kind of responsive architectural building when you're des designing a space which is a responsive space okay what are the things that you have to give consideration to space requires consideration given to what are the things that you have to give consideration to that is what they are asking mostly when you are talking about responsive that means something that is able to let's say a building that is able to respond to your needs one of the most important thing that comes into consideration is a user satisfaction you are the user you are going to tell me whether the building is responding to your needs or not passive cooling innovative that is all fine but at the end of the day no matter how innovative your building is if it is not able to respond to the users requirement properly then that is not exactly a responsive kind of a design okay so definitely user satisfaction is considered you can say it requires it requires a little bit more consideration of the user satisfaction okay okay next question number 7 creating architectural design proposal may not include formulating an area program evolving design alternatives incorporating structural services into finalized proposal design of design detail of interior furniture they are asking that whenever you create a architecture design proposal what are the things you may not include so you have to include a area program you have to basically design the entire area you have to create an area program you have to also give alternatives that is very important if something doesn't work out you need to be aware of the backup or the alternative option incorporating structural services into finalized product obviously which is very important structural and the services are very important that has to be incorporated uh interior furniture is not something that you you know start off with the proposal stage only so this can be basically left out so design of interior furniture is not that important in your proposal stage okay next question earliest archaeological evidence of urban architecture is from the vasava period buddhist islamic and arabic urban architecture that means basically related to the cities so earliest example of you can say urban planning or a little bit of urban design was seen in which period you know what it is it's the harappan period harappan period means it's your indus valley civilization right harappan period is your indus valley mohenjodaro harappa so you know mohenjodaro and harappa these were very well planned cities they had proper proper underground drainage centralized drainage pattern uh, they used a single dimension of you know bricks the bricks which were used had all had the single dimension like all the houses used same that kind of dimension the citadel was uh, you know perfectly uh, you can say planned the lower city upper city everything was planned properly so harappan period was the one 
uh, Islamic comes after Harappan, Buddhist also comes after Harappan, Masala after. So this was basically in the Sali civilization is pretty old. So first instances of your urban architecture was seen in the Harappan period. Okay. Next question nine. A white powdery deposit that forms on an exposed mass masonry or concrete surface caused by leaching and crystallization of soluble salt. Salts from within the material is effervescence, efflorescence, efficacy, efficacy. Multiple times we have seen this question. I guess we saw this question in, uh, I guess, HPAC or I guess DDA. When we were solving the DDA paper, we did see a similar kind of a question. White powdery deposit. Generally, you must have seen it's talking in term. It is talking in terms uh, like if I explain, uh, let's say I'll explain it to you in terms of brick. In brick, sometimes we see white powdery kind of substances. What is this called? This is called as efflorescence. Why does this happen? Because in brick, let's say this is a brick, you have certain water soluble alkalis. There are certain water soluble alkalis which are present in brick. When water enters, what happens? These alkalis it gets sorry. These alkalis, it gets dissolved in the water, fine. And when water evaporates, what happens? The alkalis come to the surface of the brick with the water, but the water evaporates and the alkali is basically left behind in form of white patches. That is known as efflorescence, okay. What is effervescence? Effervescence is basically bubbling in a, carb, you know, in a, in a, basically if you put some kind of, you must have seen in um, Coke, or in any kind of cold drink, if you put those mentor, uh, mentor spills or any kind of, uh, you know, those chewing gum or those, men especially mentor spills, what happens, it uh, creates bubbling. So those bubbling in your, you know, carbonized drinks, when you have those bubblings form, the, those bubbles forming, that is known as effervescence, fine. Efficacy means what? Efficacy is basically how efficient somebody is. Let's say I have an AC at home, the AC is cooling the room, but how efficiently it is cooling? That is what your efficacy. That means how good some something is at a particular work. And effluent means basically it's a discharge. So any kind of let's say industrial effluents, right? In environment and ecology, you hear about this. There are a lot of effluents which is being discharged from the industries. There are a lot of effluents which is being discharged from you know certain plants. So that is what effluent is. Effluent is some kind of pollutant discharge. That is what effluent is. Okay. Next question 10. Antonio Body's architecture is an example of Geometric shapes, floral pattern, organic shape, linear shapes, okay. Antonio Gaudi, whenever we hear this term Antonio Gaudi, we know that Antonio Gaudi is all about organic shapes. He is not about linear geometric floral pattern, okay. So, please look into a few buildings which are designed by Antonio Gaudi. For example, you have Sagada Familia, which is one of the, like the construction is still going on, right. So, you can look at the buildings and you can get the idea. Next, Pablo Picasso was known for his creations in Impressionism, Pointillism, Dadaism and Cubism. These are things that you have to remember. Pablo Picasso was specifically known for his contribution in the field of Cubism. Also look into these things uh, and try to remember a few names but this is not exactly from your, uh, very much exactly from your architectural uh, field. For example, if I talk about Pointillism, Pointillism means basically in this paintings were done by you know, putting small, small points, small, small dots. Specifically, a very famous painter, a very famous artist is Vincent van Gogh. A very famous, you must have seen Starry Sky by Vincent van Gogh. So that is a kind of a painting which is done by following the pointillism concept, okay. Next question number 12. The presence of irregularity in design in which regularity still prevails may be defined as anomaly, repetition, radiation, similarity. Anomaly. Anomaly means what? Whenever in a design, there is some kind of a irregularity, right? You can see that in, in when you look at the smaller picture, you see there is some kind of an irregularity. But when you look at the larger picture, you see that overall it is regular, but still there is some kind of an irregularity. That is what is known as anomaly. Repetition is what? Basically, you repeat a certain pattern. Create a rhythm. So let's say you have a box and then you have circle, triangle, uh, let's say triangle and then again you have a box and then again you have something else, again you have a box. So you are kind of repeating an element to create a rhythm. That is what your repetition is. And then similarity and radiation, these are you can see, you have to study about principles. From that part also you are basically basic design, BDBA, basic design and visual arts. From there also a lot of questions are asked and simple questions are asked, okay. Next question, question number 13. 
Consider the following statements. Kutch lies in hot and semi-arid climate. Okay. Delhi lies in composite climate zone. Okay. Delhi lies in warm, humid climate zone. And Kutch lies in hot and dry climatic zone. Which of the above statement is or are correct? See, Kutch lies in dry climate. It does not lie in semi-arid. It lies in an arid kind of a climate. So, definitely number one is not the right option. Okay. Kutch, it basically lies in your semi-arid uh, it, it lies in your arid, dry condition. Semi-arid is not completely dry. Kutch is basically on the westernmost end of the country and that is an arid area. It's not a semi-arid. So, one is not right, four is right. Delhi lies in warm? No. Delhi is basically, it lies in a composite climatic zone. So, what you have to do is look into the map of India which shows the climatic zones of India. And you will see that the India, basically India is divided into five climatic zones and you can get an idea that Delhi basically lies in the composite climatic zone. So, the answer will be 2 and 4, that is B. Okay. Next, question number 40. Vernacular buildings in hot, dry climate are characterized by long, elongated plans, large door and window openings, compact form with small courtyards, stilted floors with proper ventilation. Okay. Vernacular buildings in hot and dry climate. See, in hot and dry climate, whenever we talk about climate responsive architecture, climate responsive design, whenever we talk about hot and dry, we want to reduce the amount of openings. The less the opening, the better it is. We don't want it. See, what is happening? It's a hot and dry climate for climate. If I increase or if I make my windows larger, what will happen? A lot of heat will come into my room. So I want as small windows as possible. Fine. Even in uh, Rajasthan and all, if you look at the kind of architecture Rajasthan has, what you see is they have, they have very small, small openings. They have a lot of jalis which they use. So, even if they have balconies, they will cover the balconies with jalis so that, you know, it can kind of uh, reduce the amount of heat which is coming in. Secondly, you see, basically houses are very close to each other. Why? Right? When the houses are placed close to each other, it will create a lot of shaded area, right? If it is placed far apart, what will happen? A lot of area will be exposed to sun, but when it is, you know, placed in a compact, when it is formed in a compact manner, what will happen is have a lot, lot of shaded area. So definitely when we talk about your vernacular buildings in hot and dry climate, we talk about compact form with small courtyards. We want smaller courtyards. We don't want open areas much. Otherwise, it will allow a lot of heat to come in, okay? So definitely not large doors and window. We don't want large doors and window. Otherwise, it will allow a lot of heat to come in. Not elongated plan. See, elongated means... You are increasing the surface area. Maybe the surface area can be exposed to some kind of a sun. So, you are increasing the surface area. We don't want that to happen. And stilted floors for proper ventilation. Stilted floors means basically you have a building and the building is placed over some kind of a stilt. So, this is only done in places where you have a lot of uh, rainfall. Right? Generally, in places where you have a lot of rainfall, you lift up the structure above the ground. So that, you know, even if some kind of water fills up over the period of time, that will not impact the house. Okay. Ma'am, can you explain Huisala period? Uh, what do you want me to explain specifically? See, again, Huisala is not something that we have to study from the history point of view also. Not, not something that is very important. Okay. We do study about one, two temples, but that is it. If you want me to explain the temples, that is a different thing. But we don't study much into deep into the Hisala period. So you don't have to think about it. Like Buddhist is there, Islamic is there, questions are asked from that. Fine. But Hisala architecture or Hisala part of it is not something that a lot of questions are asked. Fine. If you want to focus on Hisala, you can look into some of the important, uh, you know, architectural, uh, uh, you can say, style of architecture building. For example, Islamic may. We know that mosques are there. Even when you talk about mosque, us maybe we know that there are parts of mosque. Like we know there is, uh, you have member, you have the Iban, you have the onion dome, all of these things. So you should be aware of these parts. Hasala, you don't have to go into much deep. Just look into a few names of the uh, temples. That will be enough. Otherwise, Hasala, it's fine. You don't have to go much deep into it. But this is Islamic, you can go for that. Still, if you want, maybe uh, in tomorrow's class, I have to bring in some images and I can explain some, but not much important, okay? Okay, next question. The components that contribute to daylight factor. We just now studied about daylight factor just a few questions back. Based on that, could you answer this question? What are the components that contribute to the daylight factor? Just now told in the class also. 
Could you, uh, based on that, could you answer this question? What will be the answer for this one? Based on whatever we have studied, could you take a look at the screen and tell me which will be the answer for this one? Okay, I got one answer. D. The components that contribute to daylight, I just now told you, sky component, internally and externally reflected components. Yes, you are right. D will be the answer. You have all three. It's not just any one or any two. Okay, so we just now studied about that. Question number 16. Consider the following statements. Okay. Flat roofs can reduce heat load in hot and dry climate. Lightweight sloping roofs prevent indoor temperature to increase above outdoor temperature in warm, humid climate. Sloping roofs allow flow of rainwater in warm, humid climate. And flat roofs reduce heat load and allow flow of rainwater in composite climate. Which of the above statements are correct? So they, are, they have given you four statements and they are asking you which of the above statements are correct. Let's say that even if you are not able to understand what is heat load and all of those things, let's say that you are not able to understand it. Try to see, do, does any of these four look very weird to you? Let's look at number four ones. Number four says what? Flat roof reduce heat load and allow flow of rainwater in composite climate. No. Flat roof will not allow the flow of rainwater. Flat roof will collect rainwater. That is why generally where, you know, in areas where we have a high amount of rainfall, people generally have sloping roof, right? So flat roof does not allow the flow of rainwater. That means four is definitely not the option. In all the three options, you have four. There's only one option where you have, where you don't have number four. C is actually the right answer. But let's look at the three options. Flat roof can reduce heat load in hot and dry climate. Whenever you have hot and dry climate, it can reduce the heat load. Heat load means the amount of heat which is added to the interiors. See, what happens when you are living on the roof, on the top floor? What happens because of the flat roof, it becomes pretty hot. But in hot and dry climate, flat roof can actually reduce the amount of heat because if we take about sloping roof, it kind of increases surface area, okay? Lightweight sloping roof prevents indoor temperature to increase above outdoor temperature in warm, humid climate. So generally in warm, humid climate, the sloping roofs, it is much more useful. Humid because you know that this is a kind of an area where you have a humid temperature. So in those areas, wherever you have sloping roof, it will actually allow the indoor temperature to be a little bit less as compared to the outdoor temperature. And sloping roof allow flow of rainwater in warm humid. Sloping roof, it does allow flow of rainwater. We know that. So, answer will be number C. Okay. So, even if you don't know, you can probably, uh, you know, analyze that which one you try to eliminate. Don't try to find out the right answer. Eliminate which looks very weird. One thing we know that flat roof will never allow the flow of rainwater. Never. So, definitely you have option C. Next question, Beambedka rock shelters and an archaeological site exhibiting the beginning of South Asian Stone Age are located in Aibol in Karnataka, Raisin District in Madhya Pradesh, Elora in Maharashtra State, Perambalur in Tamil Nadu. Beambedka rock structures are basically located in Madhya Pradesh, Raisin District. It is basically pretty close to your Sanchi Stupa. So, so Sanchi Stupa that is also located in Madhya Pradesh only. Beambedka rock shelters are pretty close to that. Right? It takes around one, one and a half hours of the days. Okay, so it is located in Raisin district in Madhya Pradesh. Keep this in mind. Next question number 18. Consider the following statements. Okay, as per Council of Architecture guidelines, the professional conduct of an architect shall be apply his skill, his or her skills to creative, responsible and economic development of his country, not give or take discount, commission, gift and other inducement for the introduction of clients or of work, Promote advancement of architecture, standards of architecture, education, research, training and practice and provide pro professional service of high standard to the best of his or ability. Which of the above statement is correct? Basically, they have given four, you know, in COA, they have given certain code of conduct. That means this is these are things that an architect should do. There's a code of conduct. Every professional practice has a code of conduct. Let's say planners have code of conduct, which is given by TPA. 
डॉक्टर्स हैव कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट दे शुड डू दिस दे शुड नॉट डू दिस सो सिमिलरली सी यू हैव गिवन कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट नाउ नो बडी इज गोइंग टू गो एंड रीड द कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट बट दिस इज इन योर सिलेबस प्रोफेशनल प्रैक्टिस इज इन योर सिलेबस सो डू रीड द कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट ओके वन जस्ट गो थ्रू इट टू गेट एन आइडिया व्हाट कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट इज ओके सो टुडे आफ्टर दिस पर्टिकुलर सेशन प्लीज लुक इनटू योर सीओए वेबसाइट लुक एट द कोड ऑफ कंडक्ट एंड जस्ट रीड थ्रू इट but let's say that you don't know what code of conduct is and you have to answer this firstly apply his or her skills to the creative responsible and economic development of his country obviously an architect should be able to apply his or skill for the development of the country so definitely this is a right statement secondly not give or take discount commission or gift definitely an architect is not allowed to take any kind of discount discount mean any kind of, it can be any kind of money any kind of gift any kind of thing in form of gift bribery nothing nothing is allowed okay so you are not supposed to give any kind of gift or you are not supposed to take any kind of gift for any work promote the advancement of architecture standards of architecture education research training and practice obviously you need to promote the entire field of architecture that is also one of that is one of the uh, you can say um, conducts and provide professional services of a high standard to the best of his or her ability they should be able to provide professional service of high standard to the best of his or her ability this also is a kind of a code of conduct which the architect should do so the answer will be 1 2 3 and 4 a will be answered for us okay next question question 19 characteristics of both dravidian style and nagara style of temple architecture are found in temple complex at mahabalipuram pattadakkal konark gwalior answer is pattadakkal Pattadakkal is basically an ancient village, and uh, in Pattadakkal you have a lot of temples. So few of those temples are made in your Nagara style, and few of these temples are made in Dravidian style. Now Nagara style means your North Indian temple style. Okay, these are the temple styles. That means when temples were built, temples in the North, uh, Northern side or, or the Northern India side is made in the Nagara style. So Nagara style is North Indian. and dravidian is your south indian style both of these has different different aspect like for example in uh, dravidian style you see something called as gopuram that there is a gateway right uh, then in nagara style you will always find some kind of a platform on which your uh, temple is situated right that is something there now Pattadakkal is a and this question has been asked multiple times. It has been asked in your DDA also. So this question is repeated. So what happens even if you are appearing for CPWD, it's not like if I am appearing for CPWD, I'll only do CPWD past year question paper. No, please look into other past year question papers. Like for example, DDA is there. Uh, you have uh, ISRO papers are there. Uh, you have other state papers are also there. So please look into that also. Sometimes similar questions are also repeated. Okay. And if you have time, do look through a few gate question papers. It might be helpful. There are questions which do come similar. Like for example, that daylight factor that has been asked in gate multiple times. Okay, so uh, please look into that also. Ma Mahabali Puram may you have the Dravidian style of temple. Konark, Konark is what Sun Temple. Konark is situated in Orissa. Now this basically it specifically the Orissa style. Okay, it is not completely your North Indian or the Nagara style. It is Orissa style. So you have Rekha Diola, you have Pira Diola. In this, you have the Diola concept. Okay, so it's the Orissa style. And then Gwalior, that is basically you have the North or the Nagara style of uh, temple. So remember this, Mahabali Puram, you have the Dravidian style. This you have the Orissa style of uh, temple architecture, and Gwalior is the Nagara style. And Pattadakkal is only one where you have characteristics of both Dravidian and Nagara. Okay. Okay. Question number twenty. Which of the following publications are by architect Charles Jenks? These are things that you have to remember, right? So, critical modernism, complexity and contradictions in architecture, learning from Las Vegas, and the story of postmodernism. So, these two are there: critical modernism and the story of postmodernism. These are the two uh, books which uh, were basically published by architect Charles Jenks. So, please look into architects. the books which have published which are published by them what are the different uh, theories which are given by them or different famous quotes which are given by them for example there is a very famous quote which is less is more right less is more is a quotation which is given by ludwig mies van der rohe but there is a quote 
which is right opposite to this. That is less is bored. Okay. So Ludwig Mayer's van der Rohe, he said less is more. And there's one more person who said less is bored. So who said less is bored? Are you aware of it? Who is the architect who gave the quote, uh, you know, quote of less is bored? From your uh, memory, if you can try to remember. Any idea? Yes, Robert Venturi. You are right. Robert Venturi is the person. So please do look into these things also. Uh, I know for those of you who are, who are appearing for your exam on NT, there's not a lot of time, we have a lot of things to cover. Uh, as much as possible, please look into it. But if you're preparing for deputy architect, definitely these are things that are asked and these are very simple. These are like hit or miss. Either you know it or you don't know it, okay? So please look into these kind of things. Start preparing, make a list in which you have written the famous architects and the buildings by them or the books by them or the quotations by them. Okay. So in today's class, we'll, uh, today's session, we'll keep it till here only. We'll continue with the rest 20 questions in tomorrow's session. Okay. Uh, any doubts? Any uh, questions that you have? Yes, all of you are right basically. It's Robert Venture. Okay. Okay, if you don't have anything to ask, uh, if you have any doubts, you can even put in the chat box. I am assuming you don't have anything to ask. But uh, we'll be having one more session. We'll have we'll be having the next session tomorrow, and then we'll look up. We'll take up another twenty questions in tomorrow's session. Okay, whatever we have learned in today's class, make sure you take it down in your notes, and uh, you like whatever extra things are there. The options are there. For example, what is the different kind of glasses? I told you, e low emissivity glass. And uh, ninth, please. Ninth question. You mean, uh, are you asking me to explain ninth question? This one, white powdery substance. Please con confirm once. Okay. See, question is what? A white powdery deposit that forms on the exposed masonry or concrete surface caused by leaching and crystallization of soluble salts from within the material is. Masonry is what? Whenever you, let's say you have a brick masonry, that means a wall which is made up of brick. Okay. So sometimes you must have seen on brick walls you have white powdery kind of substance. What is that substance called? That substance, that entire formation of that substance, that white powdery substance is known as efflorescence. Now what is efflorescence? In bricks, in bricks, let's say this is a brick, you have certain water soluble alkalis. Okay. There are certain, these are what? Water soluble alkalis. Alkalis which can dissolve in water. So what happens is that, let's say, uh, when you cure, uh, you know, let's say when you water the brick, when you put the brick into water, you do some kind of, let's say you do water absorption test also. So whenever water is basically entering the brick or the brick is exposed to any kind of water, you know, brick absorbs water. So whenever the water enters the brick, what happens? These water soluble alkalis, they get dissolved in the water, right? And then after some time when again it dries out, basically it is exposed to heat and the water evaporates. What happens when the water evaporates, the water soluble alkalis, it comes with the water to the surface. 
but the water evaporates and the water leaves back your white powdery kind of deposit on the surface. These powdery kind of deposit is what? This is your water soluble alkalis only which are basically left behind after the water is evaporated. These powdery kind of substances is known as efflorescence. Fine? Questions have been multiple times asked. What is efflorescence? What is the powdery kind of a substance? Okay. Is it clear? Uh, please, Amit, please uh, confirm. I hope it's clear to you. What is efflorescence? Next, uh, effervescence, I told you, you must have seen uh, when you drop, let's say, some kind of a, a Mentos tablet into a cold drink bo bottle, into a Coke bottle, a Pepsi bottle, it kind of starts bubbling up. That bubble formation in your any kind of uh, carbon drinks, that is known as effervescence. So, effervescence has got nothing to do with white powdery substance, okay? Efficacy is means what? How efficient is something? How good is something? Let's say there's a vacuum cleaner and the vacuum cleaner is cleaning the room. But how efficiently it is cleaning the room? Is it just doing a random job or it is doing a deep clean? That is a efficacy. And effluent means what? Effluent is basically discharge. Pollutants. You must have heard this term that uh, there is a lot of effluents being discharged from the industrial sites. Or the factories. That means the what any kind of pollutant, any kind of discharge, but any kind of polluted discharge is known as your effluent. Okay. So again, effluent also doesn't have anything to do with your white powdery. White powdery deposit anywhere when you hear white white powdery deposit on brick or on exposed massive masonry, it means efflorescence. Just remember it. Okay. Fine. I hope uh, with this uh, your doubt is clear. So uh, we'll keep it till here only. If you have any other doubts also. You can uh, drop it in the chat, uh, in the comment box, or you can ask in tomorrow's class also. That is fine. Fine. Right? So with this, uh, we have come to an end. We'll have another session tomorrow. Tomorrow's session will be from 4 p.m. Okay. So we'll have 4 to 5 session. 4 to 5. Okay. Fine. Thank you everyone for joining, and I'll see you in the next session tomorrow.